Today, my friends, our story begins with a group of young individuals who are pursuing a curiosity when visiting the home of a friend. With greetings going unanswered, indicating that nobody was home, or maybe our friend preferred his privacy seeing how his bike was still in the front. That did not stop this small group from finding an alternative solution to the situation. A bit illegal, but seeing how this young group are familiar with the owner of the place they just broken into, it shouldn't be a big deal, especially when knowing how the owner, Ogi, was stashing the goods somewhere within this dump. Instantly noticing the foul stench when entering the home through the window, it seems like our group of friends didn't care for the reek of death, nor Ogi's reaction when discovering that his home was being broken into. Nah, what they wanted was to see if the rumors were true, and of course, there it was. Just as Sugio remembered, Ogi's prized possession stashed away in the closet, which was a jar of honey. Even though Sugio questioned the unattended jar when knowing how Ogi was very protective over the honey, seeing how Sugio was very familiar with the honey and its taste, I don't think that really mattered seeing how that honey wasn't going to stop Kameda, Yasmin, Riruko, and Yui from crossing the threshold and stepping into forbidden territory when having one hell of a party when sharing a taste of the honey. So let's talk about this honey and why it's the highlight of this unannounced party within somebody else's home. You see, a few days ago, when Sugio and Ogi were hanging out after Ogi had came back from his trip to South America, sharing his story of bravely venturing through the heart of the Amazon jungles and stumbling upon a hidden tribe when getting lost, Ogi was surprised when the tribe had welcomed him with open and loving arms, the red carpet treatment as he called it along with some souvenirs, which explains the jar of honey. But this was a strange tribe that seemed to worship plants that were native to the region. Even though Ogi had never seen any of these plants, it was said that it was from these specific plants where the tribe would get the honey, which many had risked their lives over. Putting your life at risk over honey it does sound kind of far-fetched until you actually taste the honey then that's when it starts making perfect sense. Of course, when Ogi shared a small sample of the prized honey to his friend, what Sugio tasted was unlike anything he experienced. It was godlike, nothing compared to what he had ever tasted. But when immediately requesting a bit more, just to re-experience the blissful taste a few seconds longer, that was when Ogi's friendly demeanor instantly turned into hostility when denying Sugio another taste of his precious honey. And even though Sugio left Ogi's house with a strong sense of bitterness towards his friend because of how he was deprived a reasonable amount of honey, since that day, Sugio's mind just couldn't shake away the taste. It was like his mind and body was craving for more. Even when he would try eating something else like a sandwich or a candy bar, it didn't give off the same experience as the honey did. In fact, Sugio's mind was so fixated on the honey that he failed to notice how it's been a couple days since he had something to eat. And after convincing some of his friends into paying Ogi a visit, promising an awesome party if they can pressure Ogi into sharing this honey, well, that's how we've came to this scene of five friends breaking into Ogi's home and enjoying his precious honey. Much like Sugio, the other friends just couldn't believe the taste of this honey. Interesting how none of them cared about Ogi's reaction once he finds his prized possession being devoured. It was like everybody was so fixated on the honey, each one trying to struggle the inner temptation of consuming the whole jar. But I guess the stench of Ogi's home was so strong that our friends began questioning its origins. It wasn't the honey that was emitting the foul stench. Oh no. It was when our friends would decide to venture through Ogi's home and take a look inside his bedroom. That was when they would be greeted by a bizarre and morbid horror. The wall at the far end of the room was literally caked with blood. In taking a closer look, the friends could see flesh, bits of bone, and even hair, and when seeing the thin film of fleshy matter slowly peel itself from the wall and fall to the floor, 
That was when our shocked group had noticed the clothing within the mound of flesh, giving our friends a strong sense of dread when feeling that this grotesque discovery may be the remains of Ogi. Like any good friend who would break into somebody's home and pillage through their prized possessions, it wasn't a surprise how Ogi's friends decided to leave his home when noticing the horrid piece of decoration within Ogi's room. Not only had they left with the precious honey, but it seems like there was something else that had caught Sugio's attention, which was a map of some sort. Another stolen piece of treasure that may be of some use. Decoration. That's what it was. It wasn't Ogi. It couldn't be. Knowing Ogi and the strange stuff he would find during his travels, it had to be some strange wall hanging he picked up from somewhere. And as our friends took the stolen honey to Riruku's room, where Kameda carefully poured the liquid into five separate jars, to where everyone had an equal fifth, also denying the fact of having more honey within his jar, which was slightly bigger than the other four. Either way, our friends were now free to enjoy their individual share of honey, to gather around and embrace the forbidden sweetness that would have this dominating experience over their bodies and mind. And it wasn't more than a minute after the group of friends began tasting the honey. That was when a sudden wind would enter the room and Yasmin would instantly be flattened against the wall behind him, giving the traumatic and piercing sound of a body being splattered, all happening within a mere second. Panic had now weighed down upon our troubled friends, their minds trying to adjust to the recent horror that they just witnessed. Four friends trying to think up an explanation as to why there's a human pancake within Ribuko's room, or how it got like that. Of course, going to the cops wasn't the popular choice, according to Kameda, which is why they found themselves hiding away in the back alley with their precious jars of honey. The thing within Ribuko's room, or what was left of Yasmin, was the same thing they found within Ogi's place, which must have meant that thing had to be Ogi as well. But how? How did they get like that? It was kind of like they just exploded from the inside out. The fear of this unknown terror was becoming a torment for our friends. So many questions flowing through their minds, trying to think of a way to explain why Yasmin's body is flattened against the wall within Riruku's room. But thankfully, our friends had their precious honey, which is why Riruku definitely felt the need to ease her problems with a blissful taste. And it was within a mere second, without notice nor expectation, the peaceful skies would be interrupted by the thunderous sound of a body being splattered. And our remaining group of friends would be caked with Riruko's blood, innards, and bone. The Pancake Murders. That's what they were calling them after they found the bodies of Ogi, Yasmin, and Ruriko. And those were the first three. Because for some reason, more bodies were found mysteriously smashed into either a wall or the ground. The murders were making headlines. Mostly because of how investigators couldn't figure out how the bodies were found to be perfectly smashed. But for Sugio and Yui, our remaining friends who were going through some unexpected hardship, at first they thought that Kameda had fallen victim when the other deaths began to make headlines, until they realized that the following victims were just friends of Kameda, indicating that his share of honey must have been stolen or maybe he was smart and flaked out. So what happened after Riruko's death? Well, when our friends had finally accepted the fact that the honey and the flattened bodies were connected, they didn't know how nor why the honey was doing this. How is it that these bodies would be flattened right after the honey is consumed, and yet they were fine earlier when tasting it? Trying to figure out how the honey was doing this randomly, or if they were doing something wrong, or was it something else that they were missing, 
Of course, Sugio did share a piece of valuable information about the honey, that according to Ogi, when he was given the jar of honey, the tribe was very strict on sharing an important piece of advice when tasting it. Don't get caught. Caught by what? The wrath of a god? Or maybe something that was extra-dimensional doing this? Either way, out of negligence or ignorance, Kameda wasn't buying into the whole extra-dimensional or people falling prey to some honey gods when tasting the forbidden honey. The man was already in enough trouble with the authorities and the last thing he needed was finding himself as the number one suspect to the mysterious pancake murders, which is why he took his share of the honey and went his own separate way. That was just a few weeks ago, and now, with the overwhelming fear tasting the honey, it seems like Sugio and Yui are now learning something else about this strange honey. That for some reason, they've barely eaten any food because of how they lost the appetite for anything else that's consumable. Since tasting the honey, everything would have an unbearable, disgusting taste to it. Like their bodies denying simple foods. The hunger became a long and tormenting experience. The intense feelings of withdrawal forcing the small group of friends into gambling their lives. Sugio tried everything he could to avoid the stuff, but Yui just couldn't do it. Which is why she risked her life a couple times since Ryuko's death. As for Kameda, who was not only alive when reuniting with Sugio and Yui, equally thin and frail, Seems like Kameda may have been responsible for the escalation of the pancake burners when he explained how he was trying to figure out how he can taste the honey without getting caught. When letting his other friends have a share of his precious honey. Of course, not only did this dreadful experiment went with no success, but as a result, Kameda's share of the honey was almost empty. Noticing the lack of concern for how many people he killed just to solve this mystery, but then again, when going through the intense withdrawal of the honey, you tend to lose your sense of humanity and begin realizing that sacrificing a few bodies does seem like a rational, acceptable idea. Too bad that it didn't help them with their problem. So I guess our three friends decided to take their miserable suffering to a storm drain, away from prying eyes. Just imagine the feeling of your body slowly eating itself away because of its suffering from intense hunger, your mind and body depriving you from consuming the necessary nutrients for its own survival because of how it developed an intense need for the deadly honey, the torture of depriving yourself and taking the risk gambling your very life just for a small taste. This was something that Yui did not have the strength for. Her will to fight against the temptation was indescribable and quickly fading away. The fact is, she was losing. So desperate to give in. And all it took was just a few seconds of convincing herself that the craving for honey was greater than the risk of death. Giving both Sugio and Kamita a pitiful scene as she indulged herself with just a small sample of honey. You would think that Sugio and Kamita would have a rush of fear when knowing that another human being may end up as a pancake. But as they watched her body react to the blissful taste of the honey, it was obvious that they had no fear of losing another friend. They were keeping a close eye on her, examining her like a guinea pig, trying to see where she went wrong if things turned bloody or how she was able to consume the honey without instantly dying. For Sugio, the boy who's never had his taste for weeks, watching Yui indulge herself was enough for his survival instincts to take over and begin drinking straight from the jar. I'm not sure if he had time to experience the sweet taste before the skies would be filled with the sound of a splattered body. A body had been flattened. Yui who was showered by blood and innards, and yet the only thing that ran through her mind, surpassing the feelings of terror, was absolute joy, obviously bringing her into a state of desperate madness because of how she was convinced that she could beat it. It was only a mere second before Sugio's death, 
but she saw it. Yui was convinced that Sugio was flattened by something huge and dark. So that's how people were dying. There was something squishing them. Which was a good thing for Yui, because it seems like she can still taste the honey even if she were to get caught. All she needed to do was consume the honey at a place where she can't get squished. Which is why she frantically ran into the water with her jar of honey and began indulging herself with a sweet forbidden taste. And as Kamita watched Yui risking her life, obviously sharing a brief moment of grabbing his jar and hopping right into the water, it was when he noticed something in the skies, something barely visible hovering over Yui. Within a split second, Kamita's ears would be violated by the thunderous sound of something hitting the water, like an explosion. And as Kamita looked upon the remains of the scene, noticing the blood in the water, it seems like Yui didn't succeed. There was something else that Kamita noticed. Near the flattened remains of Sugio was a wallet. And within that wallet was a map that Sugio had collected from Ogi's apartment. Believe it or not, not only would Kameda find a way to consume his share of honey without getting caught, or maybe he just got lucky, it must have taken Kameda a few hours later that day before realizing that this map within Sugio's wallet was a way to get more honey. Jackpot for our lucky boy. It must have been a month later before Kameda decided to test his luck when his craving for more honey would have him traveling to the South American jungles, pushed through the enduring heat and relentless mosquitoes, determined to bring back as much honey as he could carry. But when he had finally reached his destination, Kameda had found himself coming upon an undiscovered wonder, one of Mother Nature's bizarre monstrosities. It was a massive plant, unlike anything that Kamita had ever seen. The branches had what seemed like abnormal hands that were black and decorated with clawed fingers. The fact that each branch was swirling like a moving tentacle would give the plant a truly unsettling appearance. Another thing that Kamita had noticed was how the branches would disappear and reappear within seconds. But aside from the fact that Kameda had came upon the discovery of a new species, he definitely noticed the sweet and strong smell of honey within the dense air. For Kameda knew all too well that he had just hit the mother lobe, and without hesitation, Kameda couldn't resist the urge of violating this strange plant with a knife, just to have a taste of the forbidden honey carelessly ignoring the other knife markings or even the darkened red spots that decorated the lower half of the plant. Like a fly being lured to a flesh-eating plant because of its irresistible sweet nectar. Kameda had just one taste of the forbidden honey before his luck would end with the thunderous sound of his body being splattered within the Amazon jungles. <laughs> 